This is the history sharing program. Now today's topic is about Vincent Cove. Does anybody know where Vincent Cove is? You right. <laughs> We're in it. <laughs> it doesn't exist anymore, but we are smack in the middle of Vincent Cove. Now on this little map, you can see it was a good size cove going into the harbor. This road that you're seeing here, this is what we know as Main Street. But in 1856, it was called Front Street because it was the road that fronted the waterfront. And if you go to a lot of these New England port towns, a lot of them have a front street, and that used to be the waterfront area. You can see that the water used to go a lot closer to Main Street than it does now. And what you will also notice in this map is there is absolutely no Rogers Street whatsoever in the 1850s. And Rogers Street will start showing up as we go through time. And the final demise of Vincent Cove had to do with expanding Rogers Street. So, but what we're going to look at today is what used to happen in this cove. And I'm using the title that Joe Garland used in his book, Ghosts of Vincent Cove, because there's nothing left of Vincent Cove. And all we have is the stories and some photos to show us what used to be there. Next picture, this map is about the exact same time period. It's a little clearer. You can get, see that it's called Front Street. And you see Vincent Cove. And we see up at this end, it's called Spring Street. Today, we only know this part as being Spring Street. We have a street coming here, which was called Vincent Street for Vincent Cove. You'll notice Water Street and Duncan Street. You might recognize the shape a little bit. This is what we now know as Harbor Loop. We're going to look in this area. Now, the next picture is actually a photograph from the Cape Inn Museum taken across the harbor. And this is the entrance to Vincent Cove. Now, if I back up, what we're looking at is right here. We're looking at this entrance. What you can't see is that behind all those buildings, the cove curves off to the right. And again, if we look at this picture, here is the entrance. And the cove is actually going up behind this area of buildings here. So that's what we're going to look at today. And what we're going to talk about are the boat builders, because Vincent Cove was one of the centers here in Gloucester for building ships. And we see a couple of advertisements and this colorful timeline of the companies that used to build ships in Vincent Cove. The earliest being A.J. Frisbee's, which later became the David Alfred story. It ran from 1869 to 1879, only for 10 years, but they made over 26 vessels there. Here's an advertisement for them, and their address is Vincent Point. Of course, we don't recognize that name anymore. It's all filled in. There's no longer a point. But overlapping, that t same time period, 1874 to 1879, only five years, we have Poland and Woodbury. Here's an advertisement for them. And again, on Vincent Point, they built 17 vessels at, during this decade. And those are the vessels we're going to look at right now. Here's the map. This is now 1872. And what you'll notice on the map is the entrance to Vincent Cove looks a little narrower. That was actually the demise of Vincent Cove. It kept shrinking. We kept building into it, kept filling it up more, and eventually it became too small to be useful. But in 1872, on this side was the David Alfred Story Yard, and on this side was the Poland Yard. OK, let's look first at some of the vessels that were built by a David Alfred Story. Well, this is a long list. We won't go through the whole list. What you'll see, 1869 all the way through 1879, they were all schooners. These lists were compiled by Gordon Thomas in his research of vessels. And so I was able to put them in order. And luckily, he had done the research to tell me who was the builders, who were the owners. And you'll recognize some of these are very well-known named companies. John Pugh and Sons, remember Cunningham and Thompson? Those all became part of Gordon's later. Dennis and Ayer, they were down on Harbor Loop. Andrew Layton was down on Harbor Loop. 
But there's one particular vessel out of this David Alfred Story batch that I want to look at, and that's the Grace L. Fears, which was 81 feet long. And here's a picture of it being built at the Story Yard. Here's the cove. You see the water. And right going in between this schooner here and this white building is the opening to the harbor. And this is the Grace L. Fears. Now this vessel is part of Gloucester's fishing history, not just for fishing, but because of one of our big heroes. This is the vessel that Howard Blackburn was lost from. And we all know Howard Blackburn's name, Blackburn Tavern, Blackburn Circle, Blackburn Industrial Park. That's all named for Howard Blackburn, who was the dory fisherman who got separated from the Grey Cell Fears during a snowstorm in his dory with his dory mate. His dory mate did freeze to death, and uh, Howard managed to survive because he let his hands freeze to his oars so that he could keep rowing. And he rowed for a couple of days and finally made it to Newfoundland. He did lose all his fingers and his toes from frostbite, but he did survive. Came back here to Gloucester, lived many years, didn't stop fishing. He still went out fishing a couple of times. He actually owned a number of his own boats. He went on a trip to California to, during the gold rush. But his main way of earning a living here in Gloucester after losing his fingers is he opened a tavern. That building's still here. If you go down on Main Street, Halibut Point Restaurant, if you look at the very top, it says Blackburn. That was Howard Blackburn's tavern. And he ran that for years. But this was where it all started, from this vessel when he got separated. Now here's the list of the Poland vessels. Now, these three just have Daniel Polin listed as the builder, but the rest were listed as Polin and Woodbury. Um, so at some point, Woodbury joins or, I mean, it looks like there's an overlap a little bit, or sometimes Daniel <coughs> just worked on his own. Some of the names we recognize again, Lighton, Parsons, and Cunningham and Thompson are the big fishing companies here in Gloucester. And you'll see, most of them were schooners, S-C-H stands for schooners, but there was a steam tug, and this is a steamer, and we're actually going to look at a picture of the little giant. What's interesting is who it was built for. It was built for the Douglas Brothers, and I find that very interesting because it was a ferry. It used to bring people back and forth from this side of the harbor to Rocky Neck and East Gloucester. It was so much faster to just take the little ferry across. This is where Beacon Marine is right now, and this area here is where the North Shore Art Association is. There used to be this very long pier coming right out there, and that's where Little Giant would dock and let off its passengers. The reason I find it interesting that it was built for the Douglas Brothers is just a few years ago, we got a new sh water shuttle. And who runs it? But Steve Douglas. I have no idea if it's the same Douglas family, but here they are, Douglases, again, reviving the process of having a ferry going around the harbor. And right here is where Vincent Cove opens up. Okay, looking at a map, we've now jumped to 1888. Notice how narrow this entrance to Vincent Cove is, and it's not so close to what is now named Main Street. By 1888, Front Street has been renamed to Main Street. You can see this is where the Story Yard was, but it was gone by 1879. Up here was where that Poland Yard was, but it was also gone by 1879. At this point, Bishop's was right here. And here is a picture of a vessel being built at Bishop's Yard. Right and back here, you can see the water. And so it will be sliding down into there. What you see back here, this is one of the old gas tanks. Now if I back up to that map, here you see it. It was between Pierce and water, and eventually there's a second one that gets built here. Down here, was where the gas and coal company was, and the gas that they created by burning that coal was kept in those tanks. And so we will see those tanks occasionally in some of our pictures. Now, here are some of the vessels that were built by the bishops. 
Now, in that timeline, the bishops were the ones who lasted the longest. They lasted for over two decades. And it started out as Bishop and Murphy. Then it becomes the Bishop Brothers for a while. And Hugh Bishop gets credit for building some of his vessels. And we will see John Bishop, the other brother, he gets most of the credit for many of the vessels. And we have a number of vessels that were built here. But there's two in particular I have pictures of that I wanted to show you. 1890 and 1891, they were both schooners. The Nanny C. Bolin was built for Tommy Bolin and the Jordan Company. And the Columbia was built for the Parmenter Company. Jordan Company was just a little ways up here on the harbor about where Rose's Marina is now and Connolly's Fish Market in that area. Uh, Parmenter was right where Empire Fish used to be down on Harbor Loop. So both these vessels were tied up fairly close by. Tommy Bolin was a very well-known skipper. Good fishing skipper, but was an excellent handler of his vessel. He was known for the speed he was able to get his vessel. And he used to brag that nothing could beat his nanny. He was very proud of his vessel. And if you look, if you'll notice that she's got very fine lines. You can kind of see why she was probably so fast. She doesn't look as stubby and slow as some of the other big vessels. She's just very elegant and could just glide through the water quite fast. And you can see definitely the water that when they're done, it's going to slide right down. Not a lot of room. Very tricky getting these vessels down into the water in this cove because it was so small and tight. But on the ground, you can see all the different pieces. Looks like they're working on a good curved piece there. Now, this is the Columbia at sea. And you can see what these vessels were built for, to be at sea. And this one is in some good wind and has its rail down in the water. Everybody else would have been kind of hanging on up here. Although this looks like there may be some people here holding lines. It's hard to tell. OK, again, Bishop's Yard. We've now jumped up a few years, 1892. And now we have a second shipyard on the cove again. And this one is right here. Now, the Thomas Irving Yard is very appropriate for us because we are sitting right where his yard used to be. This is just about exactly where the Rose Baker Center is now, is where the Thomas Irving Yard was. If you remember, this here was the story yard where they would access from Pier Street. But Thomas Irving's yard was right in here, access from Main Street. We're going to see some pictures from those. OK, and here are some of the vessels that were made by Thomas Irving. Between 1884 through 1904, we have schooners, we have sloops, we have another sloop, another sloop, but mostly schooners. And they were built all for Gloucester, with a few exceptions of Salem and a couple of province towns. So we see John Pugh and Sons, who later become part of Gorton's. David B. Smith also becomes part of Gordon. But let's look at the actor, which was built in 1902. And here it is, sliding in the water. Whenever these vessels were launched, it was usually a sight. They usually announced it, and lots of people would come down and watch these vessels go in, still do in Essex. When Harold's ever launching one of his vessels, people come down and watch. Now, this building, we will see over time slowly get changed. I believe this is the building that got remodeled into one of the theaters. Not the North Shore Theater, but the Olympic Theater. And Main Street would be on the other side of these buildings. All right. That's the building we're talking about. We're going to watch this big building right here, which we just saw. And that's where he was launching from, right here, down into the water there. And again, Bishop's Yard's over here. This is a 1903 map. Now, as we're looking, somebody was mentioning a roundish theater. Here's that other theater. It says Union Hill Theater, and it's right up here. And then, eventually, we're going to get another theater. It doesn't show up yet. But another theater is going to show up in this area that we know is the North Shore. But this one will become a theater eventually. <coughs> All right, here's some more of John Bishop's vessels. Remember, he was the one who did this the longest for over 20 years. And now we're in the years 1900, just through 1904. This is just in four years. He was the one who built the most vessels. And the one I wanted to point out 
is the Helen Miller Gould, which was quite long, 117. Remember the earlier one we looked at was 81 feet long? Helen Miller Gould was built for Solomon Jacob. Has anybody ever been down to the little park next to the Coast Guard Station and Harbor Master's office? That little green area on the Harbor Loop? That's the Solomon Jacobs Park. And that is named after one of our fishermen. And this is his most famous vessel. He had a number of vessels, but the reason this one was so famous, it was the very first schooner to have an engine in it, not be totally sail powered. And everybody thought Saul Jacobs was crazy. It was a gasoline engine opposed to a diesel engine. And that is actually more dangerous, gasoline being more flammable. And everybody says, you know, you're gonna, your boat's gonna blow up. And it did, four years later. He did get a couple years out of it. But he made so much money because of the ability to have power when there was no wind that he convinced everybody and he immediately built another vessel with an engine, this time diesel, a little safer to use. And from that point on, everybody started putting engines in their vessels and there was this slow transformation of becoming sail powered to becoming engine powered. And for the next two decades, most vessels had both uh, sail and engines and it was Saul Jacobs who started it with this vessel. All right, here's some more Saul Jacob vessels, 1905 through 1909, and one of them that I found a picture of was the Cynthia, which was built for the Sylvanus Smith Company. Interesting thing about the Sylvanus Smith Company is almost all of their vessels ended in IA. He had the Sylvania, the Cynthia, and a couple of others. Here's another one, Eugenia. Clintonia eventually becomes part of his too. I don't know, something about the IA at the end. And here's a picture of the Cynthia and a picture of the captain, Jeff Thomas. Jeff Thomas was one of the Thomas brothers. There was a number of them here in Gloucester. Billy Thomas, his brother, was also a well-known fishing captain who worked for Gortons. Jeff Thomas worked for not only Gortons, but he also worked for uh, Sylvania Smith companies. And he was eventually the one who had Schooner Adventure built, and that was his vessel. All right, in 1909, Thomas Irving's yard has since closed down, and that long building that we were keeping an eye on now says the Olympia Theater. The Union Hill Theater is still listed in 1909, but the North Shore one hasn't shown up yet, and that will show up in this area. But Bishop's Yard still operating for a few more years, but have you noticed the size of Vincent Cove? It is getting much smaller. It's going to get harder and harder to launch these vessels into the cove. And here are a few more of John Bishop's vessels. In 1912, John Bishop was ill, and Owen Lance started taking over, and then by the time he builds the Bay State, Owen Lance has completely taken over and John Bishop is no longer running the Bishop Boatyard. But I do have a picture of the Stiletto, which was one of the last vessels built by John Bishop. Not the last, but one of the last. And here are the men actually building her. You can see them working on the deck. In the back, these two men look a little bit too dressed up to be the workers. They're probably the owners supervising some of the work. And here is the stiletto all done, tied up at Jordan's Wharf, which it was built for the Jordan's company. And again, Jordan's Wharf is about where Rose's Marina is now, a little further up the street. Now this is the Bay State. This was the uh, first one that Owen Lance got credit for all by himself, no John Bishop. And you can see them, they're launching this into the water. There's only about another year or so left of vessel building at Bishop's Yard, and I'm wondering if this condition of this building in the background gives us a hint of why I, they might have been already starting to shut down the facilities there. The cove is getting smaller and smaller. It's harder to launch these vessels. They used to have to tie all kinds of ropes to these vessels as they launched them so they wouldn't go completely across the cove and smash into the buildings on the other side. Once there was a line break and it did go over and bump into some buildings and the people watching had to scatter rather quickly, but not much damage. Here's another vessel. Again, you can see if 
they weren't holding on with some ropes, they could go straight across and hit something. And that is from Bishop's Yard. All right, by 1917, there are no boat yards left. Bishop's Yard would have been here, and it's gone. What is here is the electric company, and the electric company is still in that spot. Here's the theater. What we notice is Union Hill is gone, but the North Shore Theater is now here. And this is the old theater and the old Thomas Irving Yard. This is where the Story Yard used to be. Okay, now you'll notice again the cove has gotten even smaller. Notice how it's not right up against Main Street anymore. Why? This is one of the reasons why Finson Cove kept getting smaller. We kept dumping things in it. It was basically our dump. And you can see the whole edges are filled with all kinds of garbage. And it just kept filling. This is the back of the theater. And this building, we're going to see a number of times. The front of this building is on Pierce Street. This is, the, again, the back of that theater and that building, the other side being on Pierce Street. This arrow is pointing to the sewer drain that used to come out from under here. Again, now, does this look familiar? This is the building where the Lit Center, uh, Alexander's Bread, and the theater, here's the old theater, is on the street. Now, this is before Emmanuel Lewis Street. Emmanuel Lewis Street is going right along here. We're going to be looking at this side of this building here, coming in from the other angle. And here we are, looking up. There's one of those tanks again that was over on Pierce and Water Street. And this vessel, the Claudia, was actually built in Vincent Cove. And when they stopped using it and stripped it down, they just left it here on the edge of the cove to rot. And according to Joe Garland's book, when they filled this area in and paved it over, they just dump the dirt on top. So if we were to dig up the street in front here, we'd probably still find her um, underneath the pavement. Now, this is it all filled in. And this happened in the 1940s. They used the WPA. And this was in preparation. They knew that they were going to extend Rogers Street. If we were to back up to the maps, Rogers Street, we see a little bit of it coming here. It stops here at Pierce Street. And eventually, Roger Street is going to go straight through here. But Vincent Cove was in the way, so Vincent Cove had to be completely filled in before we could get Roger Street to come in. Roger Street got moved a little. This area was completely redone for urban renewal, and Vincent Cove had already been filled in in preparation for this, and Roger Street completely widened. If you notice where the Gorton's parking lot is, it is much lower. That is the last of the cove filled in. After a good rainstorm, Vincent Cove slowly reappears in the parking lot. But yeah, this one I think is neat because I'm literally parked right here, you know, up against the building, and we are really in the middle of all this. Now, at the end of this building, you can see it continue, was where the old theater was, which is now the liquor store. Mm -hmm. And what you see right here is the Halibut Point restaurant. That's Howard Blackburn's old tavern. So if you haven't looked, go look sometime at the very top of the building. It really does say right across the top, Blackburn. And this is all filled in cove. Now, I have two aerial photos. Unfortunately, we have to keep twisting and turning because of the way the picture was taken. But here is the theater. Here is that long building with Alexander's bread. And we've been seeing the backside. This is where the Rose Baker Center is now, Emanuel Lewis Street. This is where the old theater would have been, the Olympia, which means that Vincent Cove came in right in through this area and then would have turned and gone all the way up through here. And it's been completely filled in. Remember, no Roger Street. The electric company, you can see a little bit. Do you notice the shape of the electric company? This is the old shape of the entrance to Vincent Cove and then the other entrance up here. And this property still, today, for over 100 years, this has been an electric company and it's stayed that way. Now this one completely flips upside down almost. Same view. Here you see the outline of Vincent Cove coming around mm -hmm. in the parking lot. And you will see, yep, the Rose Baker Center is now here in this picture at the time. 
And remember when we saw that vessel? That would have been right about here. It's buried right under the street. The old theater. This is where the Thomas Irving used to be. Right here used to be the David Alfred story. Up here is where the Poland and Woodbury used to be. And right in this area is where John Bishop's used to be. And that is my last picture. Thank you.